Hey folks, thanks for tuning in to this episode of Last Born in the Wilderness. Before we jump into this episode, into this interview, I just want to provide a little bit of background here. Uh, in this episode, I speak with Leah Babayan. This is my third interview with her, and uh, I've gotten to know this incredible woman over the course of about three years. I think we decided uh, the first interview I ever did with her was about three years ago, and I think that was actually the very first proper interview that I ever did for this podcast. So uh, Leah and I, Leah and I, have a little bit of a, a history in that regard. So I really have to thank her for being so open to letting me. Uh, kind of build my project and have her on that that path with me. So thank you so much, Leah. Uh, in this interview, though, we discuss her most recent book that just came out, uh, her only book, actually, that she's published so far, Liminal. And it is an exploration of her, her life growing up as a young Armenian woman, uh, fleeing the, the horrific genocide that took place in Azerbaijan in 1989 and 1990, the pogroms that were enacted against the Armenian population. Uh, at that time, as the Soviet Union was collapsing, uh, there were ethnic tensions, religious tensions that bubbled up and emerged um, in Azerbaijan, leading to pogroms uh, in which Armenians were targeted. Uh, she was very fortunate in that her and her family, her brother and mother and father, were able to escape. But as she explains, uh, that was just the very beginning of the, the difficulties that refugees in general have when it comes to um, escaping horrific conditions like that. Uh, so she explains her experiences uh, not only in Azerbaijan and the, the pogroms themselves, but she gets into, and this is in the book as well as in this interview, gets into what it's like being a young girl uh, trying to process or really be un unable to actually process uh, the trauma that comes up when this these types of events happen. Um, and then trying to uh, become uh, basically becoming a refugee, getting refugee status, uh, eventually coming to the United States to Idaho through the resettlement refugee program here in Twin Falls, Idaho, uh, where the interview was filmed at least. And uh, she discusses that whole process and what the what the reality is for refugees. And something that I really wanted to talk about is it's not just her life story, which is of course very moving and powerful to hear and to read about in her book as well, uh, but to also understand, you know, for us, for people that are not refugees, that have never been displaced, that have never had to experience that, for us to be able to understand and more more radically empathize with others that are going through experiences like this. Uh, this is this is a continuous thing. This is something that's been going on for a very long time. We've had genocides for, for a very long time, at least as far as I know. And so in order to build the spaces for love, compassion, and understanding, uh, we need to hear these stories, we need to process them, and to learn how to be more open and integrate uh, refugees into the community. And this is something that Leah has been doing in her adult life, not only processing her experiences through writing this book and releasing it, but also working as an activist to highlight the struggles of refugees, uh, not just in what they experienced in their homelands, but what they experienced in the places that they uh, land. So it's really important that we listen to people like Leah. She's a very articulate, very compassionate person, and, and I feel very fortunate to have become friends with her and to have gotten to know her over these years. So I just want to make sure that people know where to go to find her book, Liminal. You can find it on Amazon. That's the best place right now. I think she mentions at the end of this interview that she's working on getting it in uh, Barnes & Noble, I believe. Um, also, there's some local places in Twin Falls, Idaho. You can go to find her book as well. But she's been um, just really promoting this thing very well, and I'm, I'm excited that I could really help in some meager and small way um, in getting her message out there. So as you'll see in this interview, we were sitting in her back porch, if you're watching this interview at least, uh, you know, in video form. And so you see the sunset and towards the end of the interview, it starts to get quite dark. You know, we, we talked for about two hours. Uh, so in this interview, I, I'm basically what I'm doing is I'm reading segments of her book and asking her questions based on what I read from the book. So it's a truly powerful and important work. And I would recommend anybody who is intrigued or moved by what Leah has to share in this interview to please go buy her book and to support her in that way. So I'll provide a link to everything you need to know down in the description of this episode. So Leah, thank you so much for, for one, just being a friend and, and being so open and sharing so much of your life story with us. 
And uh, thank you all for listening and watching up to this point. Um, here is my interview with Leah Babayan. Okay, well, I haven't done a video interview in a while. Last time I recorded an interview was in January. I went to Portland in January and interviewed a few people while I was there. Um, most of my interviews are done through like Skype and things like that. So whenever I get the chance to sit down and talk with people in person, it adds a new kind of dynamic I, that I really enjoy. So I hope I can do more of these kind of interviews with people. And we've spoken at least two times before this on the mm -hmm. podcast and we're actually in your backyard so there's going to be a few dogs barking and a few other like random i saw a plane or something or some like thing hovering behind me um like yeah. some glider thing or, so the, or it could be uh the like the crop mm. like all the crop stuff yeah some know. kind of agricultural stuff but um so last time we spoke was was uh, Cindy Jones and I collaborated and recorded some interviews with refugees here in Twin Falls, and um, that was a part of their. Uh, she's an artistic director for Inspirata Dance Project, so she put together a really amazing, really moving um, piece, a uh, series of pieces involving some of the audio that we recorded, and one of them was with you, mm -hmm. and so that was a really like um, pretty moving discussion that we had, and so to see her transform i guess our use audio from our discussion and then use as a, as a part of this really beautiful dance project it was pretty amazing yeah it was it, yeah it was very um astonishing how well they captured so many different experiences emotions and perspectives mm -hmm. just going off of you know the three interviews like they really yeah. they really showed um as as many facets of that experience as possible it really it really was like disturbing and touching and sentimental and lovely to watch all at the same time yeah, yeah. it was very it was very emotional to watch yeah yeah the the first time it was very emotional for me to watch like the rehearsal and then I went to all the shows so I already knew what to expect and I was like okay I'm just gonna you know be supportive mm -hmm. and be here but even then each time it every time it affected me the same if not heavier uh, way mm -hmm. um, especially when I went with my dad mm -hmm. who doesn't speak English very well mm-hmm or, you know, he under doesn't understand it very well. So the portion of the interviews, he couldn't really understand. But the movement, the expressions, the music, even he was really touched by it. He was like, wow, they, they did a very powerful job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think... That was really, like, that was really amazing how they put it together. Yeah, and I think, like, dance is a much older language than words, yeah. right? I mean, it's something that's been... I think before human beings could ever even conceive of speaking and communicating vocally, I imagine music and dance was the, the first language that people were communicating through. And so with podcasting, my limitation is that it's like I'm doing audio recorded interviews with people. So it's just totally 100% vocal mm -hmm. based, right? Mm -hmm. And so with language barriers and other barriers involving that, it's hard. But when you have something like dance, it's able to communicate uh, emotions and states of feeling that um, are really hard to convey even through words, you know, and even though our interview, I think, that we had last time was really moving and emotional, I think Cindy was able to really, like, encapsulate that and then expand it and make it into something mm -hmm. much more. 
So anyway, so that was our last interview. And so before I leave on my trip, I'm going to be going to Washington next week for a little while and going on some travel. So I was wanted to talk to you about this book that you had just released this year since that last interview, which is Liminal. And I got kind of an early copy of that and is that the one with all the typos yeah, there's a few but it's like oh no but that's like how it is when you st- when you write a book i mean it's like how many how many words are in here i mean you had quite it's a substantial work i mean so obviously trying to discuss what you went through as a refugee as a young girl coming to the united states and all that i mean mm-hmm. there's going to be a few typos at least right yeah <laughs> so, but it, well, it, some it, of yeah. them i mean some of the broken or um, I guess, for for a better term, bad English mm-hmm. that's in the book is purpose. It's on purpose too because I didn't want to edit the early language learning version of me that was journaling. Yeah, you know, at that age, at eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, mm-hmm. eighteen, I wasn't. I would not comfortably consider myself literate in English till probably in my 20s. Mm-hmm. That's a long time to be um, silent and be muting yeah. or omitting mm-hmm. that part of my expression if I went only full-on correct English. So yeah. um, it just, I think, is important to um, capture that. So capture the that you can tell your story without knowing a language perfect Mm -hmm. and that you, the stories are valid Mm -hmm. and they're tellable. Even if you have an accent or don't know the right structure of a sentence or correct spelling. Um, And then also to honor all the people who don't speak English well and come to this country and have, you know, struggle with English speaking for 20, 30, 40 years, however long it mm. is, but are struggling to tell their story. Right. You know, they're trying to get this out of them, the trauma, what they survived, or um, and they can't because they have that language disability in a way, mm-hmm. you know, that yeah. is a total barrier. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, at the beginning of every chapter and also during the, in the chapters themselves, you'll be quoting, you know, a journal entry like this one from chapter one, uh, compassionate response and it says it genocide killed us inside like we like like this we are still living mm-hmm. and it says journal entry age 11 so you're you're taking journal entries uh, that you wrote I imagine when you were here in the United States by that point mm-hmm. and like that was what was really kind of struck me is it's one thing to be an adult and then to go back and reflect on your experiences as a refugee um, all that all that process that whole experience because then you can kind of tie it up and make it more neat, more easily mm-hmm. understand understood for the for the reader. But I mean, when I would just read your these excerpts that you're highlighting in this book, I mean, these are kind of they're a little disturbing to say the least, but also really profound insights that a child was having. Mm-hmm. You know, and and were these. Were you surprised when you were doing research for your book? I imagine you were looking through your old journal entries and you were... I have them. I should have... I have them, Mm -hmm. like all the different journals. Mm -hmm. I should have brought them out um, so you could see too, but... um, I mean, we could take photos of them later or something. Yeah, there's a lot. I have a lot of journals and Mm -hmm. some are still... I have them in like my boxes organized and and some are out because I do still reflect to them. I reflect on them and look through them. But um, I think... Because, so a couple things, I think one, I just was, um, I only knew how to process our reality one way. Mm -hmm. I didn't have anything to compare it to Mm -hmm. yet at 10, 11, 12, you know, I didn't have anything to compare it until I was aware of how other people lived and how other children's lives were. Mm -hmm. So then I, that's when I really, I think was starting to be, um, you know, be able to realized that what we were going through is not the norm and what uh, we were struggling with was not the norm. Um, Because before coming to the United States, everyone I knew was going through the same thing. So everyone was suffering, you know, the same consequence of being forced out of Azerbaijan. Every every Armenian person we knew, especially in, in our families, 
kept a circle just like most people do that's like them. Mm -hmm. And um, so I wasn't aware of it. And being that English was a barrier for a while, I was not aware of it because I wasn't really able to communicate. But also, some of my early journal entries are, are even thoughts that I'm having in Russian mm -hmm. or Armenian, because that was still kind of the language, that, that's still the main language we speak at home is Russian. And so when you literally interpret from Russian to English, it, you know, it comes across as very profound because the Russian language is, is very, um, like it's to the point. There's not small talk. Mm -hmm. And so the kind of thoughts and the kind of expressions I think I was thinking and feeling, they, they were very mature for my age because I was experiencing a mature reality, but also because that's just the way the language is. It, it yeah. doesn't allow for a lot of fluff, you know? It just mm -hmm. is a, a, the thoughts we were having, I think, were just very straight to the point mm -hmm. kind of thoughts. Yeah. So just very obvious about the, the reality that we were experiencing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, well, I mean, that's kind of the theme is that in, a, in your childhood was taken away from you, in a sense. I mean, um, in, in, in one of the most horrific ways you can imagine. And so the way mm -hmm. you conveyed that in this book was really, I mean, it, this isn't a hard book to read in the sense that it's it's not a difficult text, but it's difficult to read because, one, I know you, and I've gotten to know you for about three years, I think, has been as long as I've mm -hmm. known you. Um, and then to just sort of, I could hear your voice while I was reading it, you know, and that's really what kind of was hard to get through, <laughs> mm -hmm. was like hearing your voice tell everybody here that's reading it um the readers that you know this is what your childhood was like and this is what your parents mm -hmm. and i think what really stuck out is how much love and compassion you have for your family and your your um your parents and how much you empathize with their situation and how much they tried to shield you and your brother from what was happening and the way you frame that is really interesting um but I, as I was reading it, the, the way I was thinking about conducting at least some of this interview was to quote certain parts of it and then to sort of use that as a way to, to ask my questions. Okay. If that's okay with you. Yeah. Yeah. So as I was reading, I'm like, oh, this page here and this page yeah, here. Yeah, no. Did yeah. You, you have it noted probably? Yeah, I have it on my, my laptop right over here. Like I was going to page 36 and 37. Okay. Here. Um, and this part is... In my notes, it's it's I, I wrote intergenerational trauma and the way that um, get on your page here. <laughs> um, so, so I'll just I'll just quote here. Okay. Um, my grandmother told us about the 1915 Armenian genocide. Her grandparents and parents survived. All family members they saw executed and starved to death. It felt unreal hearing these horror stories of genocide. Distant. Um, distant from our peaceful lives in Baku. And Baku is the capital of Azerbaijan, where you were from. Um, sharing the stories of her family's escape to Cyprus, she spoke of witness of witness tortures, um, the drowning of women and children, the stealing of Armenian girls, and the barbaric atrocities they witnessed. Um, our ancestors live in our veins, she would tell us, tracing the veins on my hands, just as I live in your veins. For five generations, the common theme in my family was genocide, ethnic killings, dislocation, and constant uprooting. This is the Armenian fate. And this other part here, um, grandmother... Lucia. Lucia? Mm -hmm. okay. Lucia. Lucia. Would explain to us how Armenians used to be fair-skinned and light-eyed people, but throughout history, uh, including in 1915, rape was a tool of genocide. Our ancestors had fair skin and lighter eyes, but now we have darker eyes, f uh, hair, and skin tones. As the darkest child in our family, I was reminded of this every summer playing in the sun. My black hair and features always reminded me of the genocide. Even before I knew about it, I could feel it. Um, I think what struck me is this, this personal trauma that you've experienced, um, of course, es escaping the pogroms and um, the ethnic cleansing and the genocide that was happening um, in Baku in particular, um, but you're mar remarking on even looking at your face and, and your family line that, you know, hearkening back to the 1915 genocide, I was at the Ottoman Empire, the Turkish Empire, mm -hmm. towards the Armenians. Um, there seems to be this theme 
that I, I sense in your book that you touch on, which is there are, are whole ethnic groups, religious groups like Armenians, and there's probably other groups that we could mention as well that have just generation after generation of genocide and trauma inflicted upon them. Mm-hmm. And now even before you maybe even experienced your own version of that, you could even see it and feel it in your own family line. And I think that that's a, something that has come up in some of my more recent interviews is to talk about intergenerational trauma and how it manifests. Mm-hmm. And I, I want to know what your thoughts were on that, like hearing that from your grandmother um, and, and reflecting on that, and particularly with your own life experience. I don't know. I, so, yeah. we, so there was a time in my life when we would hear our, our old people or our elders or our adults talk about the 1915 genocide Mm. so there was this i think there was this point in you know in our life and and in some of my older um you know siblings and cousins there was a time that my generation spoke or were were told of the genocide of the past Mm -hmm. but when so so there was this point where i remember thinking okay there that's like history that happened a long time ago, like 1915. That's mm-hmm. when the dinosaurs were <laughs> yeah. roaming, you know, the earth. I mean, that seems like so long ago when mm-hmm. you're a child. It's, it's like if I tell my kids 1998 now or something, it's just such a long time ago for them. Mm-hmm. So there was a time when genocide in, in our family and in the Baku Armenians, um, reference to genocide was you know 1915 or 1920s there were 19 in the 1930s a few pogroms of course there's been aftershocks of the 1915 genocide campaign throughout turkey throughout azerbaijan because turkey um and azerbaijan they're considered um two countries but one nation Mm. They refer to themselves like as big brother, little brother, you know, two countries, but one nation Mm -hmm. with Armenia being that, you know, that splinter or that uh, thorn that's in the way Mm -hmm. in order for them to just be one Islamic nation. So for us, it used to be just a reference to what happened, a historic thing. But then when the pogroms in Baku happened and... In the middle of experiencing it, 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 it just felt like a threat and an emergency. Mm-hmm. And I don't think I understood it as genocide until later in my life when, you know, when my grandmother and I would talk about it and, I, and we would talk about the 1915 genocide and it would just kind of, to me, it just kind of would make sense that, well, what were they doing to us this time? Mm-hmm. You know, because this time, it it's the same thing, and and it, there's a part of you that wants to almost deny it, because modern people don't think they can be come victim to genocide. You know, yeah. and like present tense modern living, just it doesn't seem like genocide is something that can happen now. It always like something that has happened maybe in the past. Yeah, it's just too. It's an alien idea for many people. Su- yeah, it's such a. It's such a shock to even, you know, think through the fact that the human is the only species that can organize and kill itself Mm, on a mass scale. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know what other species or animal or of lesser consciousness or higher consciousness than us would put their organization skills to use to exterminate themselves right you know so Mm -hmm. it's like hard to grasp that Mm -hmm. whether whether it's happening to you especially i think as a child or an adult it's just still very hard hard to grasp that shock so we always knew of the genocide of the past and it wasn't until i started understanding how you know the women were raped and how they were taken into harems and and forced to, you know, integrate, assimilate, um, convert, change their names, and um, take on false identities, mm-hmm. you know, as Turkish women, and then and then still have Armenian identity, but just have to hide it. That um, and then my grandmother, when she would talk about our 
our grandparents, like my great grandparents, that they're fair skinned and green eyed and and I just was like, Well, why do we look like this? Mm-hmm. And then in and then in school I remember being called like a Turk because I was so dark mm. and you know, darker hair because in Armenia the you know, I I don't know if they were just the kids were making fun of us because we came from Azerbaijan, but they would call us names. And I just would think, like, why are we being called these names? And my grandma would explain, you know, she would say, well, this is what our lineage was like, and this is what happened, um, that that this colorism mm-hmm. is present even in in my culture you know in my um, Armenian culture Mm -hmm. so women um, women go at times through extremes to like lighten their skin as far as bleaching their skin lightening their hair you know passing for European that's like still a big thing to lighten stay light I think now because the kind of the the beauty standards are changing and especially with like the Kardashian family being, you know, not to, not to, not, not to say that they would be that influential, but they are as far as changing the standard of body image and darker pigmented women, especially if they're Armenian, especially Armenian women, you know, being looked at different Mm -hmm. in the standard of like what is beautiful so this generation now, you're seeing them be very Armenian looking and not lighten their skin, bleach their skin or bleach their hair to be blonde and light skin, stay out of the sun. So, but that colorism existed also in our, um, I want to say community culture mm-hmm. where in the previous generations, they tried uh, whatever they could to go back to being fairer mm-hmm. skinned and fairer lighter um, but but what I wanted to go back to is the 1915 genocide that was very traumatic for the Armenian nation the people as a nation because two thirds of our population was executed two thirds how many people 1.5 million mm-hmm. Armenians so at that time it was two thirds of the population and the majority of our artists, innovators, preachers, teachers, thinkers, poets. So the culture was definitely under attack. The culture, um, the academia, the um, intelligentsia, or, you know, that's who first was executed because they are typically the organizers of a, of a people, you know. So they're the ones that... Um, know how to organize Mm -hmm. and so you know 500,000 Armenians survived that's you know from that many of the Armenians that are alive today so there's 12 million in the world there's about I think two and a half or so million maybe in California alone Um, maybe maybe like two million but most of the the people that are alive today are straight descendants out of that 500 that survived. The majority of the Armenians in the United States are here because the orphans were saved of the 1915 genocide. That's their grandparents. And the only way that they're alive is because at the at the mercy of the brave nuns and missionaries that were... Um, saving these children, the Armenian orphans, and bringing them to the United States. Mm-hmm. So to, to kind of, you know, bring, it, bring that trauma full circle, when you have the majority of your Armenian ethnicity rooted in the, survivor, the survival of the one-third population that mostly were, were younger and were children, mm-hmm. um, and survive genocide, that trauma is is very much hereditary. It's very much generational. And even so that it is, um, it affects the health, like even of the Armenians that are born distant from that genocide, you know, they're later born here in the United States and, and they're not sure why their kidneys and 
their blood's a certain way and why their health's a certain way and why their adrenaline is hyperactive, uh, adrenaline um, in their uh, glands in their system and why they have really deep under eye -right circles um, that are dark because all this is connected. Generational trauma is a physical thing. Mm -hmm. um, the hypervigilance, all those things, the, the PTSD, those things are all part of the genetic memory of the next generation. Mm -hmm. um, even if they don't know anything about it, right. you know, the, the DNA adapts and it knows. And um, so that, that trauma is very real for in our family, what I think is um, even, even more, you know, even more present is that it's compounded. So with my great grandparents, then my grandparents, my parents and myself experiencing direct genocide for for with that you know about five generations that trauma only compounds mm. so yeah yeah i just wanted to get your thoughts on that because it's it's one of the cruelest things where you see um whole groups of people have to replay their trauma generationally it could happen it could skip a few generations as mm -hmm. as we see with the armenians at from 1915 to the pogroms was that in uh, 89 90 yeah. right yeah so within a century you've had two major or there's probably and you mentioned several in between that as well so it's just it's hard to um for me to fully i mean there's all kinds of sociological psychosocial all these various ways in which uh, scholars and um, you know, researchers and people have have uh, made sense of it on that kind of broader level but on the on the human level on our level it's really hard to get your head around and um you know how it can just replay itself over and over again through a people's history mm -hmm. um and how that manifests in all kinds of very strange and peculiar ways you know in the lives of the people experiencing it um and i wanted to get uh some thoughts on the political situation that was playing out so I'm on page 56 um, and just, I, I want to make sure to say something too with that, since we're talking about generational trauma, mm -hmm. it's, it's not even always, you know, because of war or genocide, like mm -hmm. those generational traumas, um, are even evident in, um, alcoholism, right. you know, cycles of violence, um, with huge populations, like with the indigenous population here in the United States, mm -hmm. with the African American population mm -hmm. that, generational PTSD, that cruelty and injustice that has been experienced, suffered, um, the ongoing fears that I think are just like born with us and passed on, mm -hmm. those, those exist even with populations that are on this continent that mm -hmm. don't have, quote unquote, a war going on or... Right. Um, you know, something visible as far mm -hmm. as uh, um, a visible genocide. Because I want to be real fair to the indigenous population. Yeah. There is an active genocide that is, you know, going on. Um, but it's really important that that these generational um, traumas are are seen for their effect on the following generations, mm -hmm. you know, that they, they're not just lasting in one generation. They have mm -hmm. effects in, in further generations. So, well, I'll, I'll follow yeah. up on that with another question, which is you have two children they were born here in the United States. Um, and I mean, there was something I said, uh, I don't know if I said it at the beginning of the interview or before, but something that really, that was really moving in the book was how you talked about your parents and how they tried to protect you and your brother from, even though you had already witnessed so much mm -hmm. and you were homeless and you had to flee your home country, your home city, um, everything you knew behind and all of that, you, you know, there was still this, this strong sense that your parents had of um, instilling a sense of character and, and a, a, a worldview or a view of human beings, which didn't allow you to kind of become subsumed with hatred mm -hmm. towards others because that was something that came up yeah. over and over again is like even as hopeless as it seemed over and over uh, for years in your life your parents tried to really instill that value in you and your brother um to not give in to hatred and uh, i just I, I wanted to maybe ask how that's manifested and how you've raised your children here i mean they haven't been touched by that genocide um they haven't had those experiences but 
that's, I imagine your journey as an individual was to kind of address how you were going to raise your children with all that you've experienced as well. Um, no, I mean, I'm, I'm really winging it with <laughs> my children. Honestly, I think, I think mm-hmm. every parent is, I, mm-hmm. I almost have a hard time believing when a parent like has it together because yeah, yeah. it's kind of unless bullshit. you've had <laughs> unless you've had ten children and all of them were the same, mm-hmm. you you would probably know how to raise the eleventh one right. Yeah, but for the most part, it's adapting and and um, letting them guide you, and then being very tuned in and accessible. So not just available to them physically, but emotionally and psychologically and, and spiritually being available to them. But I I feel like I have the burden of um, doing two things. One, making sure my parent or my parents, making sure my children know their history Mm -hmm. in a very authentic way, but balancing that with the emotional um, self-regulating like coping skills Mm -hmm. where they can process what happened to our family because it's also their story, you know, what happened to our family without it traumatizing them. Sure. I don't, I don't fully know how to do that. I just try to really, try to really learn and speak to a lot of my um, friends who are more, um, that are more knowledgeable and experienced with like child development and, you know, how to go about these, these, these uh, conversations with them and, to not lie to them, not to sugarcoat things because children are very smart. They're very aware of what's going on and they, they want to process things correctly and they deserve to process things correctly the first time instead of it, um, you know, processing and, and leaving a trauma and then them having to go back and right. reprocess it later when it's solidified and it's a little bit more difficult, you know, as an adult. So, the blessing has been for our family is that my children, um, for the last three years, so that's like six, seven, eight years old, have seen me process Mm -hmm. the writing, seeing me process the emotions of editing and Mm -hmm. reliving it, seeing me talk to my parents openly about it, Mm -hmm. um, coping with them, healing with them, feeling it with them. Sometimes there's nothing you can do about um, the past or trauma or difficult emotions than to just authentically feel them with people you love and care about and knowing that you're in a better place now, that you're safe. Yeah. But these feelings are valid. Mm -hmm. They hurt real. They hurt real. And to hurt with the people you love is so much more comforting than to hurt with them not being around. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. So for my children, I think that I have the, the responsibility to example to them how to process in a healthy way, um, and how to process, um, in a real way, so not just write the book and present it, you know, to people and have no emotion about it because that's just not how this is. This is this is very difficult and emotional for me, especially when I go and speak and when I'm doing book signings and when other people are sharing their trauma story and I'm listening and then there's all these triggers that are for them and for me and they're experiencing a lot of difficulty. But I think the most responsible thing that I could teach my children is that... Um, that that's part of life Mm -hmm. and feeling is a strength it's not a weakness um hurting is not a weakness it's a human strength it's a human thing it's connected to the heart it's connected to empathy and and through them experiencing me processing they process too Mm -hmm. um and then they develop love for humanity empathy compassion and if we can fill those vessels up with with the 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 qualities they need to navigate life um 
then that's then that's enough. That's good, mm -hmm. because then that will outweigh. It hopefully will outweigh the the maybe the generational PTSD or generational trauma that they might sense in them. Mm -hmm but they can at least be prepared for it, you know, with these other yeah. feelings. Yeah. And who knows what their life will present. I doubt my parents, when they had my brother and I, ever thought, well, we need to prepare for when we go through a pogrom, and we need to pre prepare for when uh, little Leah and, and little Aram experience violence and war right. and genocide and become homelessness, so let's go get books on how to be, you know, Mm -hmm. They were winging it. My parents were being parents just like I'm being a parent, young, and they were, you know, I don't want to say newlywed, but they were just starting their family and raising their children and being young and in love and um, experiencing what a husband and wife experience with, with beginning a life together. Last thing they were ever prepared for was to protect their little children kids from being slaughtered yeah that that's just i think unimaginable the more i look at my parents i just i just have so much um love for them so much just like a not a biological love i mean i have that also naturally but i have such a love for them because of their suffering as adults you know because they were going through all of this from the lens of an adult which is even scarier yeah you know, I can't imagine that. I have two little children now, and it's almost better to sometimes go through these situations when you don't know what's going on than when you are fully aware of the dangers. So, yeah, yeah, yeah i I would hope that I would hope that my children find their own value out of the book that I published here, and not maybe what it means for me and my parents. Mm -hmm. Because for us, it almost is like a living tombstone that we are sharing, and then that's like our our survival, you yeah. know. But for my children, it will be meaningful, but in a different way. And I have to honor that. I can't impose what it means to me on them. Um, and same with the with the with the trauma of whatever went went through in my life and my parents' life. Also, that it, I. I just have to prepare them for how to cope, you know, how to cope yeah. and how to feel things in a real way. Yeah. Well, that's a, it's a very centered way of approaching it, right? Because you're not, you're not trying to ignore any of it. You're just trying to be very honest with them because they're, they're little people and they, they yeah. yeah. And then know? I, and I don't know, like, that's the mm -hmm. thing. I don't know at, at what point their brain's ready for what until they share something. And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> you're like aware of that we need to talk about that now yeah. but it's usually already they've already absorbed so much mm -hmm. and then they vocalize something mm -hmm. and then i'm like catching up to that and yeah. that's just how development is because there's no uh, gauge or app i can check that tells <laughs> me where they're at in their understanding right. and readiness of what we can discuss i'll tell you something that really affected me um, so three years ago, we were, my, my family and I, we were in, in Colorado and we were in Denver. We're there all the time because that's where, um, I have family there. And we went to a big Armenian party. And first we went to this store where it's all Armenian food, spices, music, people, a deli, a restaurant, coffee shop. I mean, it was like all Armenian owned so it was everybody in there speaking Russian or Armenian or Persian wherever they're from it was a, a grocery store and my son like is like pulling on me because we were shopping for for the house and everything we were just shopping for groceries and my son like pulls on me and I was like what's that what is going on what are you doing I thought he was going to maybe ask me for candy or you know and he said mom there's m so many Armenians here <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, we're in a in an Armenian store. I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. and he's like, he said it to himself, but loud enough that I heard it. He said, I thought we were extinct. Oh. He said, I thought we were extinct. Oh. I didn't know there were that many Armenians here. 
And I was like, what? I right there stopped and I like, I got down on his level. And I was like, what do you mean extinct? He said, like dinosaurs. I thought we were extinct. I thought we were the last ones, like the ones that we know in Twin Falls. Mm -hmm. I thought that there was the genocide and that we were the last ones. That's why we do the memorial because mm. we're celebrating the ones that survived in Twin Falls. Like wow. he literally thought that there's only 70 Armenians left because that's all he saw. Right. And I thought to myself, wow, my, my son, like in his head thinks we were extinct. Mm -hmm. that's that, yeah, that's crazy. It, that was very painful to hear my own son who knows our culture very well, who lives in the culture, in the home, who has seen me write, has seen me edit, has seen me and my father, my mother, you know, look at like documentaries and videos on, on many different Armenian topics, not just genocide, because mm -hmm. there's many Armenian related right. films and things that are not centered, you know, genocide. And somehow he still got the impression that we're extinct. So it, it really affected me. I thought I, I have to do a little something different. Mm -hmm. I need to do a better exposure the exposure of him to um, the Armenian di diaspora that is all over the world and mm -hmm. throughout the United States is something I need to start doing um, so that he's aware of the fact that Armenians they're a nation they might not all be in one country but they are a diaspora nation so they're all over the world and yes we did you know have this genocide Dominic but this is why they are in Glendale this is why they are in um, Argentina, this is why they're in Australia. It it wasn't by choice that we're scattered all over the world. Right. But um, stuff like that, like he'll say, or Anjali will say things. Um, and and I'll just think, whoa, you, you, you guys need a little conversation here. Yeah. <laughs> we need yeah. to have a conversation. Yeah. But as they grow, they, they'll learn. They'll learn more. Um but they definitely are a lot more aware of the realities that a lot of people go through than most kids their age also because of their experience with me writing and, and presenting and sharing because they're aware of, you know, genocides that are happening all over the world and they're aware of stages of genocide that most seven and eight, nine-year-olds are not. Yeah, yeah, that's not something you really get taught in school. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, actually, that ties into uh, this other segment I wanted to read. It's on page 56. And this is about the, the kind of political situation in Azerbaijan um, at the time, uh, right leading up to the genocide. 56? Yeah, 56. Okay. Yeah, so let's see here. Is it Sumgat? Am I saying that right? Sumgait. Sumgait? Mm -hmm. Okay. Following Sumgait, demonstrations and rallies were organized in Baku. The men were given address lists of Armenian neighborhoods, homes, and places of employment. Armenian homes were identified and marked with a cross on a map of the city. Immediately, my family went into hiding. The persecution and hate crimes against Armenian civilians intensified in Baku. The massacre of Armenians was organized by top officials of Azerbaijan. Overnight, leaders changed the tone on the news, radio programs, uh, and spoke of a movement of identity politics, nationalism, and an Azerbaijan free of Armenians. The people were em emboldened by the opportunistic People's Front leadership who fueled us and them sentiment to further their political agenda. These leaders organized demonstrations throughout the city capital, attracting tens of thousands of men. Gorbachev sent in Soviet troops and martial law was declared in Baku, but this was a temporary calm. Demonstrations Demonstration crowds grew, emboldened by the anti-Armenian rhetoric. The crowds were supplied with iron rods, steel pipes, and knives. The men were wearing matching trench coats. They had addresses of Armenian homes. How did they get so organized? And this is a quote from your journal at age 14. You say, To blame religion is unfair and does not correctly place responsibility where it belongs. I do not blame religion. I blame politicians. I hear some say, people are sheep. But that is an insult to the sheep. Sheep don't organize mass killings and slaughter one another yeah 
And, I mean, a little ways down, you talk about being on the 12th floor and on the balcony, you saw the rallies, large crowds of tens of thousands of men marching during the demonstrations. And Yeah, um, and that's at, our, that's at our home, then at my grandmother's home. I don't know if it's in here. At my grandmother's home, um, they lived on the 8th floor. There were demonstrations out in their, outside their home, too, where um, on the balcony, I was just out there singing songs and like in Armenian and my grandmother and my mother they were yelling at me to get inside you know yeah. not to sing um, we were pretty much we felt that there was a danger as kids but we just didn't quite understand why yeah that you know singing songs were such a, a punishable thing or yeah. such a crazy scary act but um yeah i just wanted to ask about the the sort of ways in which you even as a child understood how you know people want to blame these things like religion and all this stuff but i mean really it's like who are the ones pulling the strings here who are the ones inciting well, yeah. this violence it's you know and it's so strange when i hear maybe it could just be it could just be either i'm very naive or um refuse to see it as religion mm -hmm. but just one thing for me, that explains that it's not religion. That is that the day before, people were s the same religion. Mm -hmm. And the month before, and the year before, and decade before. Mm -hmm. It's not like February 27th, there was a tens and thousands of people that became Muslims and tens of thousands of Armenians that became Christians. Mm -hmm. The religion component and people's beliefs were there always so i can't i can't blame it on religion because the day before our neighbors were the faith they were and they weren't trying to kill us yeah so what instrument what factor was different yeah you know what was um what was instigated or provoked that um that there became an us and them. What othered us and what separated and create this, um, created this violent atmosphere where it became so easy to slaughter mm -hmm. your neighbor. Yeah. In open daylight, in a very developed country, nation, um, in the 90s, you know, we're not talking about hidden somewhere and outside of the view of the world. I mean, something definitely emboldened and gave courage. And um, assurance mm -hmm. to the mobs that were doing the killings that you will get away with this. This is not going to, you're not going to get in trouble because most people don't go around slaughtering and, and massacring people. Yeah. Unless they're programmed into doing that, mm -hmm. you know? Well, I mean, you know, at the very beginning of the book, you talk about when the Berlin Wall fell in Germany between East and West Berlin and East and West Germany. Um, you know, on this side, you know, I was, I was actually born in 1989, so obviously I don't remember that. Um, <laughs> but I, I, you know, the story that's... horrible memory. I know, I should have. <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> But I remember just like, you know, Reagan, you know, Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And yeah. it was just seen as this like really symbolic moment for the world where, you know, this authoritarian communist regime was falling. And this was the first major, it, it was more than symbolic, but, you know, looking at it that way, it was a major symbolic act. And, and what you remark on is like, okay, on your side, that was an optimistic, oh, the world's going to be free or, you know, we're going to get past this phase of authoritarianism and communism and all this. But you're like, well, on our side in the soviet bloc yeah. no it was a there was a whole dynamic playing out and yeah. and um what i found really disturbing is reading what you talked about is like so soviet identity came first because everybody was supposed to be we're soviet we're communist first mm -hmm. um and then the ethnic and religious identities come after that but mm -hmm. is that that's kind of how you framed L it a little, a little bit. bit yes but especially especially for the religious since the communist, mm -hmm. you know, empire didn't really 
I think, acknowledge. I mean, there were definitely different religious groups within the right. Soviet Union, but religion was, yeah, it was, was uh, you know, suppressed. Yeah. For for the nicer version of describing it, it was probably not just only suppressed; it was actually illegal in many mm. places. Um, but in the Soviet Union, so when the when the wall came down or I, I don't you know the Soviet Union didn't collapse it was dismantled and it's not like a thing that just collapses on its own it's a very strong built institution and on on top of a belief system and ideology and it, 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 it took a lot of dismantling mm -hmm. but for the people it it did feel like an empire crumbling in real time because the currency the government the authority the bureaucracy and everything you know the schools the transportation mm -hmm. having no no centralized power and that's about 290 million people and over 100 distinct ethnicities living in the Soviet Union mm -hmm. so tension was out of consequence for um, nas you know, nationalism and the want and the will to claim independence as a republic, uh, you know, mm -hmm. from a republic to a country, mm -hmm. um, from the former republics. And I don't think, I don't think that when um, Reagan was asking Gorbachev to tear down that wall, that that was, you know, that all those things were calculated. That oh no, <laughs> that people aren't yeah. just going to be like, oh okay, wall came down. Yeah. Let's, now let's, let's start bring living in democracy like this. And yeah. All this stuff. Yeah. I mean, even even now, they're still struggling with that. Mm -hmm. In many of the republics, we're still seeing the aftershocks of, you know, when when Stalin divided territories to gift territories to like. Uh, you know, with Ukraine and then with Nagorny Karabakh, which is Artsakh, which which is what domino affected into um, what happened in Baku, and that's the territory um, that was given to Azerbaijan, but mm. it's majority Armenian Christians. Mm. So when they wanted to secede and, and proclaim independence, that's when the violence yeah. began. So those type of things um, weren't, you know, thoughtfully uh, planned for. Yeah. Or, or, um, or maybe it was by design. Maybe that violence and that instability was by design. I mean, there is definitely someone profiting off of chaos. Yeah. And so being that Baku is such a rich um, resourced um, area with oil and... There's there's just so many geopolitical reasons why instability there mm -hmm. would be beneficial to you know other powers and other nations. Maybe that was a, a massacre that 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 was useful yeah. for what they were you know trying to accomplish. Yeah, it's it's really a cynical move i mean it's like using uh, underlying ethnic and, and religious tensions to further some sort of political goal yeah and and we see yeah. this in every nation state around the world and we see it in the united states right now yeah you know that's what i was about to say yeah, and we i see wanted that to, here you yeah. know playing on playing on um you know finding a finding a scapegoat to to blame all the problems on and then delivering on a on a gold platter the solution or that scapegoat yeah, and then just basically saying attack right there. Yeah, I mean you're we're seeing that here, and it that's what's so scary about it is that even what my family went through, it began with words and sentiment and jokes and um, the grooming like culture of, wars. Yeah, and yeah, stuff yeah the, like that. The, that and like the grooming of intolerance, which seems mm. so uh, you know ben benign and just so casual and oh, well, it's just, you know, that's, you know, it's just small talk or whatever. But what it does to us as human beings and how it, you know, touches on a spot, on a, on a spot in, our, on, in our primitive brain, I think, for survival and fear and mob rule and mob mentality. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, 
it's a tactic that works and that's why a lot of our polit- you know political leaders will use it throughout different times of history to accomplish a goal mm-hmm. um, and and we don't seem to learn from it because one there is the politics of denial which feeds that cycle if there's the politics of denial then we don't acknowledge what was done you know to as an injustice to a group of people Mm -hmm. so then we don't take it accountability so then it further you know grooms our intolerance towards that group making it easier for us to dehumanize and um, victimize that group again so the politics of denial is is right there happening at the same time as the dehumanizing of that population. It mm-hmm. has to happen like parallel. Mm-hmm. No, that's not what we're doing. You know, we're not dehumanizing them. Like they broke the law. Yeah, like, right. No, we're not. No, that's the consequence. That's what we do when people break the law. You know, well, so it's, it's just like justifying it. It's like constantly. with the the uh, de- de- they call they call them detention centers, but I I like to use the term concentration camps because I think that's more of a real accurate term we should call things what they are but that we see on the border um here in the united states and it is that process because it's like so if you go back even just a few years ago they weren't doing it at the scale they're doing it now necessarily or with the same kind of um cruelty i mean it was still very cruel i think people need to understand this is a long-standing tradition you know previous presidencies and administrations have enacted similar measures but under trump it's sort of a new level of dehumanization that's happening and so, you know, you go back even a few years ago, people were using the same excuses to justify the dehumanization of these people trying to, f- to leave uh, war-torn or, or wherever they're coming from, from South or Central America. Um, and, um, and so now we're at a new level where, I mean, all the information that's coming out from detention centers, these, these camps, um, and people are still using the same kind of language to, to that politics of denial that's like, well, if only they did it this way or this mm-hmm. way or this way, we wouldn't have to do this. But it's like the cruelty is, is escalating and the same denial is being implemented to justify those actions. Mm-hmm. And so it's, um, I imagine for you, I mean, for me, it's like, this is new. Like, this is a part of my my life. I haven't had this, these experiences to draw upon in, in previous experiences. So I think having your perspective, I know you've been pretty active in speaking up about that and doing yeah. what you can to draw attention to it. Yeah. Yeah. I, there's very little I could do about it, but I know that the biggest thing that I can do is one day answer my children, Mm -hmm. what did you do about it? Yeah. And that to me is so much more important than, you know, anything else Mm -hmm. is being able to face my own children. You know, we, we worship together. We, we uh, practice our faith together. Um, my children know the values of not just our culture, but our faith, our spirituality. And so if I am asking them to walk a certain walk um, with the values I'm instilling in them, but then I don't demonstrate that as an adult to them, how can I look them straight in the face in their eyes and and feel a connection, you know, feel an honest connection with them. Right. Uh, I can't do that. I, I, I don't know how other people can do that or if they do that, but I can't do that. If my children ask me, you know, what did you do when this was going on? Just like if it was during the Holocaust, you know, if someone would have asked their parent, well, what did you do? Yeah. How could you just stand there? Yeah. How could you not, how could you not be affected by it? Even if you can't do something, what did you do? Mm -hmm. Did you demonstrate? um, Did you say something? Did you write a letter? Did you vote a certain way? It's like the bare minimum. What did you do? Yeah. yeah. Did you lose sleep about it? Did you hurt? Did you care? Um, I I want to be able to answer my children in a very honest and real way and in a way where it aligns and reflects and reinforces our, our Christian beliefs our spiritual beliefs and our val- our values in our family and is in our culture. Yeah. So um, that I think that that's like what we talk about all the time as yeah. a society. That mm-hmm. that's what we value as a society. And 
Um, I hear Christians talk about it, that that's the, we're, we're called to, you know, be humanitarians and witness and live a Christ-like life. Mm -hmm. I cannot imagine Christ or any other prophet or um, savior or any other religions, um, spiritual teacher and leader, just kicking back and turning off the TV when that was going on or saying, well, they should have, you know, they should have followed the law. I mean, we're land of laws. I mean, right. I, I cannot imagine that. I cannot imagine that. Like that. I, I don't know if that's the, if that's the religious leaders response, then I don't want to worship that God. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. there's a, there's a, there's something I wrote in my book for my children, which I think is, is how I'd like to, you know, guide them and raise them. And it says that, it's in the beginning where it's the dedication and it says, you know, what's what's ethical is not always legal and what's legal is not always ethical. And my prayer is they do know the difference in their heart. And I feel like there's times in society and there's times in our um, country, nation, world where we're stepped up to defend our, our human ethics above law. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's what we're called to do as human beings. If we need the law to tell us how to be human, we've we've reached a very dangerous point. Yeah. If the laws is what um, keep us accountable to one another, keep us humane and ethical. Like if it's only the law that keeps me ethical to you mm -hmm. and keeps me from like destroying your property and hurting your children. Mm -hmm. then we've reached a, a very dangerous point in our society. There should be human, ethical, dignity, decency that that's led by the soul that is way before any law. Yeah, know? no, I completely agree. <laughs> um. Advise me. Fotografier vy nás chodíš? She's, do you wanna, she's do you going wanna... to take a picture and leave with the phone. Oh. <laughs> she should join but, in the interview. Oh, you want to be in an interview, Anjali? <laughs> Just make sure you don't... <laughs> you actually just double check. It's freaks me out how my much you and your son or your son and your daughter look like you and your brother on the cover does Anjali look like me yeah she? a little bit yeah my yeah my especially your your son and yeah your brother. I, I know he really does I've had some people ask me they're like why is your son's picture up there <laughs> I'm like, like well that's actually my brother yeah it's a trip yeah it is it really is <laughs> yeah. and right here we are the age of I think we are both the age of Dominic and Anjali here. Okay. So now I look at these kids different, you know? I, yeah. These kids, I'm just like, oh my gosh. I think about, you know, when my, like the most traumatic thing for them will be if my phone battery dies right now or, you know, <laughs> yeah, they, they get called a, a name at school or something. It's... It's different, but it's just the same effect, you know. For mm -hmm. them, it feels real heavy. It feels real. But I just think about what my brother and I were experiencing at their age and um, and get jealous mm -hmm. in, a, in a happy way, not in a negative way. Like, I get jealous that that's what childhood is supposed to be like. Right. And I'm just like, that's so sad. We... All we wanted to be was children. Yeah, of that's course. That's it. Like, that's yeah. all we wanted to be. We didn't even want to be it. We just wanted to play. Mm -hmm. We didn't even know we were children. You know, we just wanted to do the act of play because that's mm -hmm. just all a child does. And that's all they think about. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, when um, I, I remember in one of my, um, um, one of my rapid eye movement treatments sessions we were going through like this dialogue you know to like do the um emdr it's 
eye movement, uh, recentralization. And that helps you deal with PTSD it's and things. Very, yeah, it's very... Yeah. I don't know if you got to that part of the book, I, I but did, I yeah. write... Yeah, I write I've, about I've, that. I finished it, actually. I'm right? a, yeah, good, yeah. good. Yeah. Um, I, I'm a big advocate for um, EMDR for, for treating um, PTSD in veterans and soldiers and, and civilians of war mm -hmm. because even more civilians of war because unlike soldiers who are conditioned to experience war civilians aren't yeah. it just i mean it literally just like happens mm -hmm. it just happens it hits them it, and they have no psychological conditioning for it mm -hmm. so especially children and so i'm a big advocate for the kind of therapy that requires the least amount of talking because it's very difficult to put into words some of these experiences, some of this trauma. So art therapy, dance, music, um, play therapy for children or, you know, with, with um, EMDR, it just helps the brain process trauma and file it away that it's not constantly in a circuit of, mm -hmm. uh, like danger and adrenaline and um hyper vigilance it just folds it it folds it away files it away where it's a safe file mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and your brain's able to to process it in a way that it's not in the in the trigger mm -hmm. able or mode right yeah, yeah you know i i it's kind of different but uh, i interviewed a, a uh, child psychiatrist i think he he's uh trained as a it's like two, three years ago, but it's like Dr. Ben uh, Sisa or Sessa, excuse me. And he's in out of England. He was doing the first MDMA trials with um, uh, helping people with uh, addiction and, and trauma. Mm -hmm. So he was explaining how that psychoactive drug works and how it's it kind of ex similar in that when you are trying to even think about traumatic memories or even when they, whenever it comes up, however that trigger, you know, whatever, you go into fight or flight mode, you're unable to mm -hmm. really like process that memory that traumatic memory and uh, mdma the way it works on the brain is it allows you to it kind of it, it, it doesn't deaden exactly but it can kind of like disassociate it almost in a sense it's like it, i mean it's it's like trying to integrate parts of your psyche that are are ignored or not that's like kind of how mm -hmm. psychedelics have worked generally is it kind of bridges certain parts of your cognition that are often not working together mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so when it comes to tr traumatic experiences it actually allows you to visit that trauma but it doesn't shut it down automatically it, right. it kind of bypasses that fight or flight response yeah and so it's not it's not even that it's about being like a pleasant happy ecstatic ecstasy kind of experience it's more like finally this relief comes because i can finally look at what happened to me and I can uh, process it and then work with that. So it's it's not like a, a, a fix-all. You don't just take it and go to a room and just say, okay, mm -hmm. you're good. It's like, let's integrate this as a tool of therapy. And so he was doing, again, this was a couple of years ago, but he was the first to do those trial uh, clinical trials for MDMA in the United Kingdom. And they're doing similar things in the United States. So the, the first phase is kind of to try to get the, what is it, um, the FDA, I guess, to approve it. And it's this there's all these hoops you have to jump through and it's really but other but other th methods like you described other techniques i mean there's all kinds of things that yeah. are coming up that are really effective in helping people process traumatic experiences yeah and so. it's not and it's sometimes not even the person like the personality because mm -hmm. the personality's in the present and it's aware they're you know not under attack they're not but it's the mind and the mind it it is its own it has its own ways, you know, the mm -hmm. mind has its own ways of um, creating safety mechanisms, um, habits, and processes, and mm -hmm. um, communication with the rest of the body in order to keep it protected. Like, the mind wants to protect itself first. Yep. We don't always know what's going on. That's why we have reflex. Yep. If the personality, if my personality had to realize to move my hand from the stove mm -hmm. to not burn it. it might take me a while you know because i'm not a very quick reactor sometimes yeah but the mind it's set for safety yep. so the the best way i've understood and had um 
um, EMDR and therapies like that that have to do with reprocessing trauma explained to me is the way that we experience um, thrillers and scary movies. We're sitting there and we know that we're in a safe movie theater in our home watching a scary movie, mm -hmm. but because of the techniques of sensory camera angles, rapid movement and music and some of the um, ways that the director is directing our eyes mm -hmm. on that screen, we feel fear. Yeah. We feel adrenaline and we feel what it feels like to, to go through a very scary experience. So it's like a rush. Mm -hmm. And... And it's silly when you think about it because we're sitting in a safe movie theater. We paid for this experience, but our <laughs> yeah. body doesn't know the difference if what's in front of us is real or directed, played out, acted out. Yeah. So when, when therapies, what the therapies do is pretty much take that trauma and put it on a screen, sort of say, then have a part of your consciousness, a part of your mind, see it for what it is and then process it in a slower less um, fight or flight in adrenaline mode yeah so that yeah. it can so it can like I said so it can process it for a experience a memory um, but without the emotional and physiological mm -hmm. response yeah. to it right um, and that's why talking about it can be so hard because the words can, for the mind, trigger the, the memory and the emotions in a way that you do start going through it. Like you're watching that scary movie again. But if there's a way to process it without actually full-on body feeling that memory, that trauma, then there's chance. It's not, it's not like it happens right away, but there's chance to, to loop that... Um, brain wave in a way where it goes from fight and flight to that was a horrible thing I've come out of it safe things are better now and yeah. then here's what I can do with that that continual thing now like mm -hmm. I can see it for the value in my life or you know give it to God or whatever is the way people process you know some people they go through spirituality and some people go through it by just letting it go Right. So it just depends. But um, definitely, if that's not done, then there is a circuit that is happening that is, you know, mm -hmm. fight or flight constantly and triggered. And that's what triggers are, is they trigger a component of that memory or an emotion or a sensory of that that could be very different um, than what actually happened in that mm -hmm. first place. So instead of it... A bomb blowing up like for a soldier it could be uh, a dish breaking mm -hmm. but for the brain it just triggers now that loop yep to then go through that trauma full on so yeah. that scary movies playing and in, in a part and in a way that they're not even fully aware of it but causes them to full-on feel it yeah yeah it, it's it's very sad how um most of the injury that that our um, soldiers and military people experience in, is invisible and how difficult it is to address some of those, uh, some of those traumas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I wanted to ask, instead of quoting, I'll just ask you about it. Um, but, you know, it seems to me what the, the good amount of the book is you talking about everything that came out after the initial pogrom, the, the uh, uh, fleeing Baku, and you went actually to Armenia is mm -hmm. that right? And your parents, your father was able to find some form of shelter, mm -hmm. I mean, temporarily. Um, and it was in a shed. Is that right? Uh, on the school it was grounds? In the, it, was in a, it was in the school. It was a utility closet that was in the school. Okay. So you and your brother and your mom and dad lived in this yeah. closet yeah. for three years, about? about? Yeah, about four years. Four years, okay. Yeah. And the thing that really came up here is, um, it's like you, you experienced this, you witnessed some horrific things, some horrific violence. You talked about your aunt, uh, you, you, you lay out some details of what happened to her, which is really difficult to read. I can't even imagine, um, processing that and imagining that, but, 
um, but then you are dispossessed. I mean, your your family is trying to make ends meet, and um, that almost seems like maybe not more traumatizing, but that compounded that trauma because you had no support system any longer. There was even your so-called kin, I mean, other Armenians that are supposed to be there, like, oh, like, you experienced this. Why? Why? There, there wasn't this um, empathy there from anybody, from the adults, from the kids that were your age. There was just, they bullied you and they treated you, you and your brother and your family really terribly. Um, I don't even know what my question is with that, but it's just like, it, that's another aspect of, I guess, uh, seeing the side of human beings and human nature. While I, 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 I try to really articulate, you know, as you mentioned, you know, in here, it's, I don't think, it, this isn't a human-hating book. This is really about just addressing that side of human nature and human beings that comes out when uh, that is stoked, you know, as we discussed the, pol- the political system and everything that led up to it. Um, but even when you come back and you're, I mean, you're dealing with this thing that happened to your family and... And at the time when you were the most vulnerable, that's when people seem to treat you the worst. And I don't know how you how you make sense of that. I have a hard time trying to make sense of that. I I feel like that's the time when people, when I would feel the most empathetic, or I would think I would try to imagine myself in a situation. I don't know what I would really be like, but I won't speak highly of myself or anything. But I just think that that's the time when people need the most support. And, and there can be oftentimes a situation where the exact opposite happens. Mm-hmm. And I just I don't, I don't know what is your well take remember on that? well remember that the the same time the we're we were going through um, fleeing and becoming displaced Armenia was experiencing the earthquake and and yeah, homelessness there was, a, there was a natural and, disaster as well yeah you know no no food starvation mm-hmm. um, no distribution an interruption to everything because the Soviet Union was collapsing at that point and so Mm. Armenia was in this like other republics was in this space of just gridlock Yeah, you know not only the international community wasn't able to reach it to help it the humanitarian efforts because of the threats by Azerbaijan to shoot down humanitarian planes um, and the ongoing war between uh, at the border of Armenia and Azerbaijan, but also what, what could the Soviet Union do at that time? They, there was no, there was no, um, I remember watching, this is a great example of what Armenia was going through. I remember watching an interview that somehow I came across that now there's all these old interviews you can like watch. Mm -hmm. There was an interview with the Soviet higher ups in Moscow responding to the Armenian earthquake cri- uh, you know the crisis of like getting down there to help mm-hmm. and the issue one of the biggest issue of the fact that they couldn't bring the cranes the giant cranes down to Armenia was they the people that designed the cranes never thought about the fact that the cranes would have to fit inside the airplanes <laughs> and that's just kind of you know, and that that's like a perfect example of that Soviet mentality that it just wasn't very well thought out, you know, that yeah. there would be a, humani- a humanitarian crisis on a scale of what happened, mm-hmm. that we would have to take these cranes down there so no one thought about how to put them in, the, you know, build them so they would fit inside the planes. Right. So, um, there's just... The empathy, we're, we're, I think humans are able to be empathetic mostly when we're safe first. Right. When we're safe first. Well, it's like the hierarchy of needs, yeah. right? Like when certain needs are met, then people are relaxed. There yeah. isn't a sense of scarcity. People are like, okay, now I can help yeah. my neighbor. But now if I can the, help my but if yeah. the, But if the people are starving, struggling, scarce resources and trying to survive themselves, they are not, no matter, even if they're the same nationality or ethnicity or religion as you, or even family sometimes, they they are going to 
not express very strong empathy towards you because they're trying to survive. Yeah. So I struggled with that in, in my writing. I think part of it is uh, there. It's captured how I struggled with that and just almost went through a, a phase of blaming or even in some way disassociating with those Armenians because they were the way they were and we're somehow different. You know, mm-hmm. it just I had to I had to process it in different ways. And one of the ways I processed was that they just they were very cruel to us mm-hmm. um, like beating down on someone when they are the most down yeah you know most down and on top of that going above and beyond to further make their reality difficult like you know smearing feces on their yeah. door like blocking their pipes of yeah. water yeah. like calling them names like pretending or or or, or um, falsifying that they stole something in school like going out of your way to create misery mm-hmm. in someone else's life that's the only way i could process that as a child was they're not i'm not like those people mm-hmm. so in other words i had to disassociate but as i matured and understood my own shadows you know in my own mm-hmm. psyche and understood what all of us are capable of Mm -hmm. and you know just how our we're we are needs based and needs driven Mm -hmm. people that where it's very easy to have empathy when we're fine and we're safe and we can almost like be spectators spectators and feel empathy Mm -hmm. you know um that that's not something that's possible when you yourself are dying or yeah. starving yeah. or hurting or, or, or in danger. So I learned, um, I didn't learn it. I came to a point, I remember, um, in my later in my years, probably when I was, you know, near, near like 17 or 18 years old, where I started to understand um, a lot of that mistreatment through a very compassionate lens Mm -hmm. and I had to it's not even because I wanted to it's because I had to because how I saw my own people was and and I mean that because of our shared ethnicity so how I saw my own people was the first reference point of how I would see the rest of Mm -hmm. humanity Mm -hmm. and I didn't want to see humanity I didn't want to feel a, a fear of people or a hate of people because somehow I don't know how but somehow I was aware enough to realize that if I did that then that became a self-hate yeah and a fear of my own self because th- I am the same as everyone else yeah so something about that really and and there's so many people that helped mm-hmm. so it's almost unfair to have a general feeling for Mm -hmm. people Mm -hmm. when a few hurt you yeah but the majority are just good decent Mm -hmm. humans Mm -hmm. that don't have much to give but they still give right you know themselves they share in your misery they share in your suffering and that's the biggest giving that any of us could ever give to anyone else is the sharing and in pain with other people Mm mm-hmm yeah. You know, that's the that's the biggest that's anything that we can ever give is our own self and and share with someone else what their pain and suffering is. Yeah. So I think experiencing that um at different times um just made me realize that I have to just understand, you know, that people were suffering too. And maybe worse than me because I was so privileged I had a mother and a father alive. Mm-hmm. When a lot of the people who had loved ones in the pogroms or in the earthquake because more people died um, because of, you know, more loved ones died with the earthquake too and were left crippled and homeless than just with the pogroms. So, I mean, who chooses which which hurt is more hurtful, you know? Mm -hmm. It feels the same way. Someone lost their father and mother, it feels the same exact way as if I lost mine. Yeah. 
So I think just processing and maturing helped me understand. Um, but it also gave me perspective because just because we're in the same culture, that doesn't mean within our culture we don't other. Yeah. Or divide. Mm-hmm. I mean, even here in the United States, Americans are divided against Americans, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And whether that's by ideology or um, the game of of blame Mm -hmm. that's so played, especially, you know, with that narrative of they're at fault, this group's at fault, this group, that's like the game of blame is just like a hot potato that's happening and the hot potato or the game of blame is played with fellow Americans, like who who what who is a greater enemy than us against ourselves when we are bickering? Yeah, yeah. And the whole world's watching. Mm-hmm. We could not project a bigger weakness to the world mm-hmm. than our vulnerability of dividing amongst ourselves constantly. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's just like astonishing to watch that from the perspective. So I gained perspective for that from for that when I experienced what I experienced um, being in Armenia and still being persecuted by my own people, but understanding what they were going through. Yeah, yeah. That's complex, very complicated feelings. It is. It is. Yeah. Um, until you feel it through compassion, mm-hmm. until you process everything, everything complex when it's processed through compassion. And humility, it is so simple. Because mm-hmm. just because we see these adults acting this way, they're, they're still vulnerable, fear-based, childlike, survival-motivated beings. Mm-hmm. Um, they hurt the same way. They act out of fear. They act out out of fear. Mm-hmm. Um, and so compassion allows us to see that you know it, compassion allows me to see a, a an adult who's hurting another adult as a hurt child right because something began that cycle mm-hmm. yeah so but it takes it takes a long time i mean now i can speak about it so quickly and articulate it but for the longest time i didn't understand it and then didn't have words for it and in its place was disassociation Mm-hmm. bitterness hate um you know even uh even even like the mocking of spirituality like right just all these things that just take place of compassion mm-hmm. yeah right. yeah and we've been talking for over an hour so i'm just gonna ask you this kind of other question i wanted to quote something here it was from it's one page 123 um this really is just sort of talking about after you'd come to the united states as a refugee uh, the sort of lack of support system that exists because you do you do have some really pointed criticisms I mean well being sim- like complicated right being simultaneously grateful for the opportunity to come to a more stable place mm-hmm. with your family and that opportunity was important but also recognizing like you're just sort of giving people the bare necessities here uh, to build something like a life in a country in a culture that you're very unfamiliar with and um, people think, oh, that's enough. And then become assimilated, become American, and that should be enough. But and particularly with your parents having a very hard time, um, you know, finding a, a, a support group or, you know, something that can really support them. Mm-hmm. Um, so let me see here. Uh, I looked around and everyone looked so different than me. Different faces, different clothes, they smelled different, moved differently, and they all stared at me. At lunch, I couldn't recognize the food. It smelled funny to me. I just wanted to go home to be with my parents and brother. I hated going to school. That was until other refugee children moved into the same town, and we would meet in our English learning class. Um, And as I made a few new refugee friends, school life began to improve, English as a second language, ESL courses were a step-by-step introduction of the American English to foreign speakers. English is a very difficult language to learn. My father was very clear in letting my brother and I know that school was our job. Education was stressed and valued in our family, and I knew that my family's life depended on how well I did in school. 
Very few have the privilege of extended family support, childcare, or time to attend English learning classes. When refugees arrive uh, to Amer America, they are expected to get to work right away. At best, refugees get a below minimum wage paying job where very little or no communication was necessary. Working 8 to 12 hours a day, cooking and caring for children, it was difficult to learn English. Uh, my parents did their best to learn English. With our help and from what we learned at school, we could help we could help them get around. Uh, for years, my parents walked around with translation books and papers with written English phrases to point to in order to communicate. Rebuilding our life was their priority. They had no other option but to work. Working two full-time jobs each took our parents uh, out of the home the majority of the day. They wanted to save for a car, to save for a house, to provide us with a stable life. Um, and uh, I think I'll just stop there. But ba basically, I mean, you kind of talk about just seeing your mom and your dad just walk to work, uh, just struggling just, just to make ends meet. And, and how here on the next page, it's like my parents' social life was with other refugees who just arrived. Mostly the conversations were about the violence we all survived and how each of us escaped. They assisted each other in adjusting to new jobs, homes, and life in America. It felt good to be around people who understood what we lived through firsthand. Overhearing their conversations over dinner or tea made me realize how important it was for all of them to share what they had survived. I realized early on that my Amer or, excuse me, my Armenian people uh, suffered from generational genocide and that this was our common story. Mm -hmm. So I think I, I want to point to, if you want to talk a bit about this difficulty of integrating into a new society and and given just the bare necessities i mean um i know a few years ago there was a pretty it kind of became a, a controversy around here in twin falls because the refugee program you had a kind of i would say a, a resurgent kind of right-wing thing where they want to shut down the, the refugee program and keep people out that they viewed as a threat to america i guess right mm -hmm. um that's kind of cooled off quite a bit since then i, sh I imagine that's still kind of under the surface I, I know it would be um but i think what needs to be addressed is that even though we do have a, a resettlement program here um it's insufficient in many ways uh in, in aiding refugees and integrating and just having a stable life and you know, I, again, talking about how almost the most, one of the most traumatizing things that I, I sensed anyways from reading your book was, yes, the pogroms and the violence against you was obviously the beginning of that, but um, the lack of support systems, uh, the poverty and all of that, and then, you know, coming to the United States and being given something, but like, it's incomplete. So what what is your take yeah, on the, that? The, so with the in, the insur the insurgent or how do you say that did you say that I, I the, think I said the, like kind of a right wing kind of um, almost insurgent or uh, how was, I said it it was it was a fringe yeah fringe, it's a fringe group even even a uh, even out of state yeah yeah um, yeah there are people coming in out of state mm -hmm. um, stirring up yep of a, a anti refugee sentiment that our community experienced but again it had to connect with some kind of sentiment that existed absolutely because because we could have an outside group come and try to stir any kind of sentiment here mm -hmm. but if there isn't an existing some type of feeling here yeah how successful would they be so they were effective because of whatever kind of sentiment already existed here mm -hmm. um but out of that the blessing in disguise out of that was that the refugee resettlement program had to really evaluate and kind of revamp itself in many ways, mm. mostly because so many eyes were now on it. Oh, okay. Um, not just national, you know, having the auditors here mm -hmm. and also just the attention of the national and international media. I remember doing an interview with people from Japan, the reporters from Japan and um, a lady from Germany. And I thought, why are they here? Because it was such a big topic that um that just kind of spread yeah um with the fake news which we mm -hmm. knew here before it became a thing yeah you fake know way news. before our, mm -hmm. our our president used that we knew fake news i mean twin falls invented it in a way <laughs> we were the yeah. first you know to kind of feel here on the ground level something happened and within 12 hours it becoming fake news yep but having real gravity behind it yes so um but 
the refugee center here, I think, had to definitely step their game up to the point where they're having, you know, they provide some daycare, they're orienting, taking more time to orient people in the community with the transportation, with following up, with interpreters, with um, classes for the youth, with summer camps. And Mm -hmm. some of these things began a little bit before that, but I would say the majority of that response is in consequence to so many eyes and so many locals now aware oh, yeah. of this program. Pre, there's like the pre-refugee resettlement, uh, pre-sentiment mm-hmm. years mm-hmm. where it was, I mean, this program very few knew about and the refugees, their experience was not known. And you would ask nine out of 10 people anywhere in Twin Falls, you know, what, you know, what are refugees or where's the refugee center? Does Twin Falls have one? No one would know what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Uh, now it's such a a mainstream comedy co- community um, known. Yeah. That you know, regardless of what kind of sentiment someone might have about it, they're aware mm-hmm. of that the center's here, that the relocation happens here, and more people are um, volunteering and participating, like through church groups or by themselves. So there's a lot more eyes on it. Yeah. When my family and, and many of the refugees that came here in the 90s and late 80s, you know, even um, even early in the, in, the, in the 2000s, I think, what they experienced was a very vulnerable resettlement location because they were resettled. The resources weren't there and the community wasn't aware. So they were left in a in a space of just, you know, um, navigating on their own mm-hmm. and surviving again mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and not in the most friendly atmosphere because people expected them to learn and know English right away and mm-hmm. assimilate. So there was this expectation to assimilate without the shared responsibility of an adoptive community collaborating and partnering to make sure that integration is happening Mm -hmm. with the proper tools, information, and resources. We're not talking about handouts. We're talking about basic knowledge that anyone would need to know to Mm -hmm. survive a new society like understanding the financial system, understanding the legal system, understanding property rights or what is an interest rate or a credit score or, um, you know, what are your rights when you're pulled over by a police officer or how do I file a complaint if I'm being discriminated against or victimized? Can I file a report or will the police officer shoot my family? Mm. Because these are very real fears in people who have survived genocides and pogroms and have seen people in uniform and at places of authority be the tools of those massacres, yep. you know, and, and shoot family members and kill mm-hmm. family members. So um, I think it's just a responsibility of an adoptive community to help the people they are adopting integrate mm-hmm. into their community. It's not the burden shouldn't be fully placed on the new person arriving into a new society yeah it should be either you know shared or met you know with some kind of compassion just like if you were adopting a child into a a, you know a new family Mm -hmm. and that family was just unaware of that child or off or would say you know you've got to have to bring your own resources and figure it out but um that compounds the trauma because now again, you're surviving in a new environment. You're scared because you're not sure, you know, who's safe, what's safe. Mm-hmm. Um, you're vulnerable to being victimized, taken advantage of, whether that's financially or physically. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're a woman who is new in this country and um, you're violated at your workplace and your job depends on your family surviving and your employer says if you say anything or if you um, call the police I'm going to have you deported yeah you think she's going to file a report or yeah you know or or anything even a child I remember I don't write about it in my book but I remember a woman um, who was part of an after school program who 
hated us foreign kids and i don't know why she was working with us if she hated us she was so mean to us but i remember one time she was uh, dropping us off and my brother and i and three other children i think they were bosnian were kind of the last ones on the on the route mm -hmm. to drop us off and this was like a youth pastor lady and we didn't speak english very well but so we spoke to each other in english or in russian in the van And with our Bosnian friends, we would just kind of talk to them and understand, you know, because it's a little bit similar. Yeah. And as I was walking out of the van, so I'm probably like 11 mm -hmm. years old, maybe, yeah, 11 years old. As I'm walking out of the van, because she told us, she's like, speak English. And we're like, okay, but we, it's not natural for us to speak English. We don't know enough we're English. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. Like, yeah. we don't, it's not natural for us to be able to speak English to each other. And number one, number two, we're not talking to you. Like, we're kids in the back yeah. of the bus having a kid Such conversation. A, that's always weirded me out when How do you feel do you're, like, entitled mm -hmm. to know everything we're talking about if we're not even talking to you? Yeah. But as I was walking out of the bus, and my brother was, it was like a little bus, you know, not a school bus, but like a van. Mm -hmm. um, is the other kids were sitting there, three kids, but my brother and I, we were getting dropped off. So as I was walking out, my brother was like getting ready to go right after me she reached over and grabbed my ponytail and yanked my head back so hard and she said i said speak english you speak english when you're around me and i, I mean I, i my brother just he was just looking at me i was looking at her i was looking at him i was like okay like i just walked out and i didn't tell my parents Because, you know, I didn't want my parents to freak out and maybe, like, go and my mom maybe go and, like, choke that woman out. Because <laughs> my mom's a bear. Like, she's a mama bear. <laughs> yeah. If someone did that to my child now, oh, you know. Yeah. So, I knew my mom's temper. I was like, I'm not telling my mom. Plus, I was scared that we would, our family could get in trouble or get deported. Yeah. Where, you know, you don't know. You don't want to cause trouble at school or anywhere because you fear your whole family will suffer. Mm -hmm. The last thing I wanted to do after we survived everything was cause my family any more suffering. Yeah. But uh, my brother saw it. And after that, we did not feel safe around her. And we, I think we started to like somehow make excuses so our parents wouldn't let us go to that after school program. And, or at least we would hurry and go home with our dad so that we wouldn't have to get a ride by her. Yeah. But um, there were many times when adults you know, mistreated us, um, where it stayed with me. Um, but it's something I couldn't tell my parents at that time. You know, I yeah. just think my parents would have reacted and it, and it would have caused more problems. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, just not having, just not having the kind of advocates or having the kind of, um, awareness in the community, um, especially a community like Twin Falls where there's not a lot of diversity, So yeah. when someone yeah. comes here from Russia or Armenia or the Middle East, like, and Africa, mm -hmm. you know, for, for people, that's like a big culture shock here. Absolutely. Yeah. Imagine how much of a culture shock it is for us, like, when we're brought here. Mm -hmm. When we're the only people like us here. Mm -hmm. That's like a bigger culture shock, you know? At least we aren't... At least we're aren't aware of the, um, or we are aware of the fact that it's us that's making people uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But are the people that are having the culture shock with us around? Are they aware of the fact of how our discomfort is too of being yeah. new in a new society? Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's just the 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 human way to react to anything that's anyone that's different, not anything, but anyone that's different. Mm -hmm. But it's very surprising to find that in the United States of America, that's a blended society of mm -hmm. groups and ethnic um, immigrants that have escaped persecutions from all over the world to create a new free society. Yeah. So that is where that shock really is. It's like, okay, well. Well, I think I think America, because of that, I almost I feel like people have brought um, back to trauma, but they bring that with them and. Um, that doesn't necessarily make a, a cohesive or co um, yeah cohesive society automatically, 
right? Uh, and and I think that that order for America, I want to call it America, but our nation to, um, I guess to to be that thing that we often think it is, or at least taught as children, to get to that stage of in, of integrating different cultures, ethnic groups, religions, and all this. I mean they're going to have to identify and really it's like with personal trauma you have to find ways to look at that and integrate that and, and process it and as a collective we haven't really done that and you know i remember the discussion people were having about um 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 with uh, slavery and um reparations like there was a recent thing on that and um you know, we really have not come to terms with that as a country, as a people at all. And there's still just sort of generations after the fact that are dealing with that. Um, so that's just one example. And, and yeah. also the indigenous people, and not like you mentioned it before, I mean, all the, all the different groups of people that have been marginalized and have been oppressed by this culture. Um, yeah, and unless those are really brought out to the light and we look at them and talk about them in a mature and... Um, healthy way we're not going to move past it and it's just going to continue to play itself into the future um it's so, a, it's yeah. exactly like it is in a, on an individual level mm -hmm. the processing of trauma mm -hmm. it's the same way on a collective level mm -hmm. so long as there's a active participation in the denial mm -hmm. So whether that's the, the politics of a denial or just a person denying their own pain, their own hurt, their own mm -hmm. struggle. Because mm -hmm. the trauma of slavery is on both sides. Yeah. Of those who have inherited the legacy of, you know, slaveholders and the yeah. legacy of the, the finances being the mm -hmm. base of their... Um, their way of life now or their yeah. legacy, their family legacy, um, economic legacy, whatever mm. it is, yeah. or just um, identity politics, you know, that's a mm -hmm. legacy of that. Mm -hmm. um, structures of racism that still exist, institutional mm -hmm. racism, I and mean, the trauma's on both sides. So the denial, um, so long as it's continued, there is not a space for um, allowing a new emotion to take place in a new shift of um, attention and new relationships to develop and grow so long as there's this space being filled with denial. Yeah. Um, and, and not an authentic truth because you can't find authentic power in denial. Um, you have to come in terms with 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 what the power that is in the now moment in today in in the society that we are now in the person that I am now in order to be able to reflect back on what was experienced and find value in it find truth in it find healing in it um, and begin the narrative of a authentic life or begin a narrative of an authentic society and an authentic nation's narrative instead of a purely heroic narrative that conveniently omits all the pain. Yep. Or if anyone brings that up, then they have to be somehow unpatriotic. Yep. You know, if they want to bring up reality, <laughs> mm -hmm. they're unpatriotic. It's like, how dare you don't feed into our narrative, national myth of strictly heroic narrative. Like that's not healthy. Mm -hmm. Um, there is a, a very real past in this country that has generationally um, caused trauma in different populations. And to deny that past is to deny their reality and what they're going through right now and their generational trauma that mm -hmm. they're experiencing. So it, it just continues that cycle. You know, the injustice just takes on a different form. Yep. But um, I think we're getting to a very... Um, it's dis it's uncomfortable and it's kind of escalating and emotions are very raw, but it's good because now we're getting to, I think, a very honest point where mm -hmm. we are facing both the consequence of the past and the consequence of denial. Mm -hmm. Where mm -hmm. now it's like the only other thing we could do now is invent 
the denial of denial, mm. Mm. which I'm sure is possible because we humans are great about, you know, creating uh, pockets of shadows within our own like collective consciousness. I'm sure mm. we could come up with that, but we're as a society and and with the revelation of so much information and just how see through our our history and and society is nowadays. I think we're we're not wanting to hold the weight of that anymore. We're wanting yeah. a truly free society. We want to be true, not only free individually, but we want to be true of the trauma that we inherit, mm -hmm. you know, from from past mistakes. And for me, the most important part of writing this was one for my children to know our story, but for me personally, it was to fully liberate myself from from the trauma yeah. and to fully liberate myself from. Uh, a place of um, evil mm -hmm. you know because mm -hmm. in order to process what happened to me I have to go into a very very evil space of where evil is possible on that scale where mm -hmm. genocide is possible and I want to liberate myself from that and if I can bring this into a value in other people's lives and and go into different communities like I've been with the book tour and talking to them and help them break free from whatever was going on and the trauma they've experienced, mm -hmm. um, then it it turns into a value that is so beautiful. It it's like um, the the uh, with the song where um, um, Tupac talks about the rose that grew out of a concrete. You know, I love mm -hmm. that that mm -hmm. that poem. Not even the song, but the poem he has when he is um, someone's reading the poem about that and um, in one of his um, lyrical CDs and if we can grow roses out of concretes uh, in our own personal lives out of trauma or in our society mm -hmm. then I think that that's the, the most um, beautiful full circle you know that's yeah. the most beautiful thing we can do out of it is turn beauty out of out of trauma yeah yeah I think that's a beautiful way to wrap it up because we've been talking for a while. The sun is leaving us. I think it's, it's starting. Getting, yeah, this is the perfect uh, kind of way to get yeah. to the end of this interview with the sun setting like yeah. this. Yeah, so. well, great. I'm glad that I, I'm hoping that it captured um, in there the, the as beautiful as it is out here, like in real life, because it's so pretty. Yeah, this is a beautiful um, backyard you have and a beautiful area. Um, and of course we had the dogs barking and all that. So. And when you were talking about people being sheep, did you see there was the sheep back there? I did. Yeah, that I hope that pretty, shows up. I, th I was like, oh, wow, uh, they're right on cue. The, uh, the like, sheep hey, are right hey, on cue. Hey, hey, don't I talk hear? about us that way. Uh. <laughs> did I hear about, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you speak very highly as sheep. You say sheep would never do what human beings do. They so would never do that. Yeah, so to say like, oh, people are sheep. My father said that to me all the time. He would say, people are sheep. And I would say, are we sheep too? And he would say, are you people? And I would say, yeah. And he's like, then you <laughs> answered your own question. And I never understood that until I realized that with, with the circumstances, if the circumstances were different and if we were the majority and if our politicians used xenophobic rhetoric and the divide mm -hmm. mechanisms of othering and, and scapegoating um, another population yeah. would our men get organized that way would we create that violence I mean we're all capable of it yeah. all people are yeah. Yes. Your and little Oscar puppies. <laughs> yeah. He's Oscar has to like. <laughs> he has to make an appearance. Well, I think we're we're pretty much. I mean, that was a great final point you made. So. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. I I am so honored that I've had the opportunity to interview before while while I was still in the writing phase. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, early on. Yeah. And then be able to, um, you know, process my writing. And, and see the value in it, even when we did the interview and seeing it become the production with um, Inspirata. Inspirata. Inspirata <laughs> at CSI and yeah. seeing them, you know, choreograph doing the choreography into the um, yeah. the interviews of refugees was yeah. so touching. Yeah. And then um, be able to then follow up and, and do this interview with you now that the book is mm -hmm. published and, and, and is being shared. And now I'm working on putting this into a script. Oh really? So um, hope the hope is and the goal is to 
Um, I've had a few people contact me to either work on a cartoon, mm. illustrate a cartoon mm-hmm. of this child experiencing mm-hmm. um, some of this, what's going on in the book. Yeah. Or um, to film, you know, film a movie. Okay. So yeah, that will be exciting, and and I'm open to whatever you know creative ways the story can be told, mm-hmm. um, in order for it to be the most value to other people. Because for me, it already fulfilled such a, a liberating mm-hmm. component, you know, for me personally. So that's really I'm glad that it did that for you. Yeah, and it was good to read this, and um, you know, like I said, it's like I could I could hear your voice while I was reading it, so it kind of had another level to it, but um. Anyway, so yeah, thank I, you. Yeah, and I just want to you know show this book again. Um, Amazon is a good spot, right? That's yep, where people available wanna, on Amazon. Um, there's local places here in Twin Falls, the Arts Council, Heritage Center, okay. um, but in down at the boutiques available. But if people that are not in Twin Falls or if they want to just download it mm-hmm. um, to their gadgets devices, um, it is available on Kindle, and then also on Amazon. Um, okay. And soon it should be available through Barnes and Nobles. Perfect. It's in a review process, and so they should let me know within really the next good. couple of weeks. It's a long process. I never realized yeah. that they take such a long time. It makes sense. Yeah, and, and I think getting it on bookshelves actually will really help because it's one thing to just have it online, but yeah. you know, to get it in, especially in the for independent authors yeah. and um, anyone that's self-publishing. Um, I want to really encourage people to self-publish because it is possible, mm-hmm. um, but it does require a little bit more work. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, yeah. Malia, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Okay. Oh. Oh, if that dog is going to keep doing that. Hmm. I thought I saw them home. Hey, wait a minute. I'll just see Maybe. if they, they go away. <laughs> <laughs>